This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Today, I want to jump into something I find interesting. I'm looking at a profile of a very accomplished trend-following trader, a written profile, discussing the firm's history and key features. I'm not going to mention them by name. It will be obvious to those that follow the trend-following world, but the name for the reason I'm doing this particular podcast isn't as important. Of course, it's important and will be on the podcast soon. But I just wanted to talk about some key features in this profile. Number one, location independence. When this trader started his firm in the 1970s, he was in the Washington, D.C. area. He wanted to move. He didn't want to run his new money management firm in the Washington, D.C. area. Having grown up in that area, I can understand why. He moved south. He moved to a nice, sunny, warmer climate on the water and has been there ever since. Location independence. Today, a billion-plus dollar firm, same location since the 1970s. Now, are you sitting back and you say to yourself, I must be in New York, I must be in London, I must be in Tokyo. Well, actually, from a trading perspective, no, you can be anywhere. Number two, their approach and philosophy has remained consistent. Quantitative models that profit from major trends in up or down markets and avoid losses by exiting losing trades within days. Agnostic to which way the market's going, clearly, cut your losses short. I mean, everyone has read either Reminiscence of a Stock Operator or some book about Jesse Livermore or some book about the old guys back in the 20s and 30s. Cut your losses short. It's not a sexy sounding rule, but it's the rule. Third point. Everything they do is 100% systematic. There's no override and no individual decision-making whatsoever. Now, how many of you have seen somebody, anybody, offer an opinion about a market in the last year, two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years? There is somebody offering an opinion about what direction something will go for some typically inane reason every day, 24 and 7. And you know what? I'm sure measured by IQ, many of these people are very bright, but they don't know what they're talking about. I like the view from the guy with the 40-year track record. There's something to be learned from that view. No overriding, period. Number four, the way they designed the trading mentality of this firm, the trend following trading of this firm, is that this firm would have a 1% chance of losing 20% or more in a rolling one-month period. And since the early 1970s, the firm has met that objective. They've surpassed the 20% loss in a one-month period in 1.2% of the time in real trading. So they take on volatility. So what's the secret that they understand about volatility? 40 years into the game, they're not trying to give a fake straight line up equity curve. They kind of know that the bucking bronco, the big loose mitten, not the tight glove, is the way to ride it. 
That's not easy for people to accept. I had a guy come on my blog the other day, wrote this long missive about his trading system. And I saw one thing really quick. It said he had 70 to 80% winners. I said, well, this is not trend following. Somebody else came on and said, oh yeah, that could be trend following too. Okay, look, you know what? By any classical definition of those people that call themselves trend following traders, that have the measurable track records going back decades, 70 to 80% winners is not trend following. It's something else. But just name it something else. Don't try and confuse the hell out of everybody. People are confused enough, aren't they? Number five, risk is initially allocated evenly to each market. So what happens in wheat has the potential to contribute the same as what happens in a 10-year bond. Now think about that. That is truly the target of opportunity. That is really saying, beyond just the easy, you know, diversification is the only free lunch you have and all that kind of stuff. Bingo. This is saying we don't care where we make the money from in our portfolio. We don't care. Do you care? Do you care where you make the money from? And if you care, why do you care? I mean, if we're just being very objective about this and it's just about trading... Shouldn't you just be after the measurable results and be agnostic, not only to market direction, but agnostic to what are the markets in your portfolio? Yes, you have to have a process for assembling that portfolio. Yes, correlation has to be considered, but ultimately you don't care. If you make all your money in one year in coffee, that's how it unfolds. I thought those points, those five quick points were great just reaffirmation of trend following. It can never get old to think about the process. And there are key points that I just went through from a track record that is approaching 40 years. Even if you hate trend following, if you hate me, if you hate yourself, if you're just an angry screwball with no friends, deep down, you still got to look at those numbers and say, shit, these mean something. These mean something. You can't just ignore them. And if I was to add a sixth point in there, it's the outlier move. It's the outlier move. Is your trading strategy, like the firm that I've been talking about in this podcast, whose strategy is absolutely prepared to take advantage of an outlier move, are you prepared to take advantage of an outlier move? Or are you just long equities with your fingers crossed, praying and hoping that the Fed takes care of you? Look, these are legitimate thoughts and concerns. I'm not just being a, a, a gripe today. Now, speaking of a gripe, I want to add one thing here. So I got an email recently from a guy very upset about my interview with Daniel Kahneman. Very upset. And I want to play a passage that I've seen and he referred to from a Charlie Rose interview. This is about a three to five minute segment that I'm about to play from Charlie Rose talking to Daniel Kahneman about a few different things. Talking about trading, number one, the ability to make money in the markets, the notions of prediction and forecasting, the notions of Moneyball, Michael Lewis's book and film, Moneyball, and Kahneman's view on all of these. Now, the guy that wrote me was very angry. And, you know, when you get these kinds of emails, and I do get them, you can look at them and you can say to yourself, wow, I, I know this guy. He's using a fake name, but you can recognize the writing and all that kind of fun stuff. First, before I 
get into that, let me just play this clip that he was so upset about. Roll it. Take us to the realm of traders, people who we think have um, enormous um, instincts. You know, there is a there is a debate about where intuition does and does not work in financial markets. So I'm on pretty safe ground when I say that in the stock market, in picking individual stocks, uh, you know, traders... It's all the numbers. It's, it's luck. I mean, you know, they're, luck. Play, they're playing a game of luck. They feel they're playing a game of skill, but most of them so, are uh, playing a game of luck. So you can do all the system two you want. It will not tell you no, what you need to no, know. No, because... It's just luck. And that's, that is not anybody's fault, you know. It's the same thing with pundits trying to predict what's going to be the state of the United States or of China in 15 years. Pundits are no better at it than than readers of the okay, New York but Times. Why not? I mean, doesn't history matter? Doesn't no because uh, empirical data matter? Well, in some cases it does, in others it doesn't. So I mean, when, the, if you know the, the difference, market, yes, we do know actually. I mean, we know that the stock market is chaotic, is extremely complicated. And it is not, it doesn't have enough regularity for people to learn. So what about all these people who've got made billions and billions of dollars every year because they put these very smart mathematical models in silos and, uh, and those silos tell them the way the market's going to operate and well, then they make... Well, the, what those mathematical models are doing, they're not picking individual stocks. They're picking up trends. Uh, and some of these are micro trends and some of these are macro trends. And, you know, they're... they're able to if you're able to predict what the market will do in the next five seconds you can become very rich doing that right and uh, and so a lot of these uh, work on programs that mm. are in effect you know it's no longer let me take two examples of, I'll give you two examples of people who made a lot of money because they made yeah. huge bets one was George Soros betting on the British yeah. currency and the other was John Paulson betting on the subprime yeah well they're both very interesting examples. I mean, I would never sell George Soros. Uh, he he operates, and his big bets are on an understanding of the world economy and of trends, and 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 an ability he claims to anticipate how people will react to these trends. Anticipate. That's your game. That is your business. That he says he understands how people will react. Will, will react. That's that's your he, business, not an economic model. It's he claims he can do it. And, you know, and he has a very, and his as track say, records is, is very, very, very good. Paulson, uh, you know, I mean, at least in some of the trades that we know about, I mean, he was he was shooting fish in a barrel. I mean, it's not. Oh, well, yes, that's so, true. He was uh, shooting fish uh, that is not. Uh, some of the great successes are because people who are already billionaires and have yeah. a lot of control. And then he had a, he's had a rough plotting for a while. Yes, and they have a made lot a big, more. Big year, and then came back and had a not so big year. Yeah, they have a lot more information than so other people. So if you're people. so smart, you win all the time. As maybe we should say. Well, and it, uh, history proves that that's not true. I I don't think that winning a few times proves that you're smart, and losing a few times doesn't prove that you. You have to look at the world, and as you have to ask whether the world actually affords enough regularity so that it becomes learnable. So and your answer get, is? My answer is, in some cases, like chess, or my wife's moods, or, you know, many yeah. other problems that people saw, the answer is yes. And in the stock market, and in long-term forecasting, and sometimes even in medium-term forecasting as in wars, the answer is so no. So what's the difference in long-term forecasting and chess? Well, in chess, there are regularities. Mm. So you can predict what's going to happen. If you know where you are now, you can predict what's going to happen next. And that is how people develop intuitions. You know, that's how people learn to read. So chess and reading have a lot in common. You recognize situations and, you know, snap diagnoses by medical experts. There are regularities, they pick them up. They learn those regularities. When there are no regularities, I would say, forget it. It's not going to happen. Now, Michael Lewis wrote a profile of you yes. for Vanity Fair. Indeed. What was the story? Well, Michael Lewis wrote Moneyball. And right. He wrote Moneyball about Billy Bean, who right. was, you know, that, that man in... Now a movie. Uh, uh, and, you know, a beautiful movie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and 
So he did that. Now that book was reviewed by a couple of friends of mine who are, you know, well-known behavioral economists. Uh, I mean, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. Right. They reviewed Michael's book for the New Republic. Right. And they said, Michael wrote that magnificent piece. He doesn't seem to know that a lot of that is known to psychologists. That actually, if you apply a mechanical or statistical system to prediction, you will do better than what is called clinical prediction. Mm -hmm. So an algorithm will beat scouts if, if you give decent information to both. The algorithm will use the information better than the scouts will. And so that got... So, but if that's true, then why hasn't... I mean, why hasn't it proven to be true since... Oh. Or have other people adopted it and therefore oh, yes, it's being used have. smartly? Oh, so yes. in other words, the, the algorithm that was being used by Billy Beam's team at the Oklahoma A's uh, is being uh, oh, used by many people today. You know, if you remember the end of, uh, of right. the film, he's he, he often... He didn't go to Boston. He didn't go to Boston, but Boston adopted his system. Ah. And they won, they won mm. the pennant two years later. So the game has changed. Now, for the life of me, I don't see anything in that clip that does anything except provide the psychological foundation for why trend following excels. Common points out that it's extremely difficult to be a stock picker. He talks about consistency. He talks about, in the money ball part of that, excerpt that I just played. He talks about the system. You know, data, if you take data in the baseball world and you give it to the computers, they're going to do something different with the data than the scouts. That's trend following 101. And I think what's especially interesting about this crank that wrote me so upset that I, I think what he wanted me to do was to basically say that Kahneman, and he questioned Kahneman's integrity in the emails to me, he basically wanted me to say that uh, Kahneman has no integrity and that he really doesn't believe that there's any traders that can make any money. And hence, the reason I had him on my podcast is, I assume, disingenuous, wherever this guy was going. But when you re-listen to the section, it's a fantastic buttressing of great trend trading behavior, great quant trading behavior. I mean, Common talks about it in that passage. He says, like, prediction forecasting, it's not going to work. He talks about the day trading, the high frequency stuff, and how that's not the way to play it. Now, perhaps deep in his belly, the only thing he wants to do is be an index trader. However, I think what a great conversation would be is to get people like Daniel Kahneman, Dan Airely, Gerd Gigenreiser, Ed Sakota, Bill Dunn, Larry Height, get them all in the same room. Guess what? Here's a bet. I think that'd be one fantastic conversation, and I think there'd be a lot of agreement. Because if there's one thing that I've learned that I do very well, I curate well. I've done it on my podcast. I bring certain people on my podcast because they bring something. They bring something interesting. Their story, their passion, what they've learned, what they can pass along to others. And that's just awesome. I love it. And I love curating brilliant people into a podcast to get others to understand to get others to understand that there is a way out. There's a way out. There's a way to find success. Whether it's being a trader, an entrepreneur, running a business, or just creating your piece of art. There's a way out. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer 
in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.